I have learned so much from all of you over the years, and you are the ones who are building a, a good, solid, just country. So it's my honor to learn from you. It's exciting, too. We even built a, an umbrella cooperative today. We, we take our community into action. So uh, that's fantastic. I was asked today to talk about policies, policies that build community. And you know, I thought it might be helpful first to say a few words about policy because it's not a word that you know oftentimes we use in our conversation, or there's at least not a lot of agreement, perhaps, on what it is. Because I know there's some people I talk to sometimes who say, "Oh, you're talking about policy? That's to me that means police. <laughs> it means the government again, telling me where to go and what to do, and you know, and what to pay." And there's other people like Paul, for example. When I first met Paul, he said, oh, policy, I know what that is, that's marketing. <laughs> and I think Paul probably thinks everything is marketing, but he did, think, he did think that policy was marketing. And you know, to some extent, he's right, because you do need to sell your ideas at the end of the day. You need to communicate them, but first, you need the idea. <laughs> you need the product or the program or you know, the, the service, the benefit, whatever it is that you're trying to do. And then there are still other people who say, you know, a policy, I don't do that. That's not, you know, that's sort of there. That's maybe what you do, but it's not what I do. And what I think is really important is the fact that policy affects us profoundly in every single aspect of our lives, in everything we do. It's, it's all around. It's in the air, it's in the water supply, it's in the food that we eat, where we grow the food, how much we pay, where we get it, how safely it's harvested. It's in our transportation, it's in our airwaves, it's in our, uh, the new law on anti-spam and what you'll be able to send over the internet. We, we can talk about that. It is about what we pay and what we contribute. So virtually every aspect of our lives is touched by policy and it really, you know, to say it's sort of, well, that's you over there. Um, I, I think we really have to understand how we all are affected so much by it and how we all can play a role. Now, it's not only governments who are involved in policy, because think of your own organization. You probably all have policies in your own organization. Just think about you know, your benefits, your salaries, your uh, the directives that you give to employees about uh, working with the media or uh, reporting to the board. So every organization has policies and you're all involved in that to some extent and you can actually affect the quality of your environment, your work environment, your workplace very significantly just through your own policies. We actually can all make substantial changes in our own areas of work through what we do in our organizations. And the private sector too has policies in terms of human resource policies and some of the bigger organizations have what they call corporate social responsibility guidelines that govern their relationship with the community, whether they'll donate part of their profits, pre-tax profits to the charitable sector. So actually policy is, is virtually everywhere. And, uh, but you do need government to do public policy. Governments have to be involved, and it's various levels of government depending on the issue that we're talking about. But governments are involved in public policy primarily because of the scale of the decision. And it means that when you have public policy, you're affecting a large number of people whether it's a certain group, like let's say First Nations, for example, or New Canadians, or a certain city. You know, we had Calgary flooding and we had emergency money that went to Calgary or Lac Megantic with the train derailment uh, accident. Or you may have certain regions of the country, like the Ring of Fire in the north or the oil sands in, in northern Alberta that are affected by policy. Or it could be the whole country. But basically, we're talking about a certain scale. At the end of the day, Public policy is supposed to be about a decision that's taken in the best interest of citizens. Now, I know that there are decisions that have been taken recently that some of you would argue are not in the best. Tim, you can speak to that <laughs> on the pipeline issue. You know, and you can say, in whose interest is this action being taken? But in theory, 
public policy is a carefully designed set of decisions to act in the best interest of the public or of the, that population with which you're concerned. Sometimes it's to solve a particular issue that we've identified, like assist with the flooding. And it's more than just government, but it is effectively government. So let, let's, um, or, and that's what I'll be talking about today. So just as a summary, carefully chosen set of actions designed to protect the public interest and promote it helps tackle key problems and not just a government thing. Oh. Now that's a lot. <laughs> that's a pretty big agenda that I've talked about. So I was thinking, how do we think about policy in a way that really is, um, you know, maybe a little bit easier to, to understand? And I thought, maybe we can think about it as a cup of coffee. <laughs> For those of you from out west, I hope you appreciate this because I think you understand things in coffee terms. But everybody knows coffee. So what do I mean by that? If you're going to have a cup of coffee, you need a cup. You need a glass or a container or something. And if you're going to have a cup of coffee, you also need something in your cup. You need coffee or you need your drink. And when we're talking about policy, what we're talking about is both the cup and the coffee. Because the cup is the context, it's the neighborhoods, it's the place, it's where we live. We're shaping the place that we live. And there are substantial numbers of policies that affect our place and our community. These are crucially important to building caring communities. And oftentimes we go right to the, the service components and we go right to, okay, what is it we're gonna do now with people, for people, um, without thinking enough about how we shape the place. That affects our world considerably, as you can imagine, but affects very deeply our ability to associate. And unfortunately, the way in which we've designed some of our places are not very conducive to the kinds of associational relationships in the building that, we're, that we want to talk about, that the caring communities. So how do we build a place that's appropriate? And then we talk about what's in the cup because those are the things that we do in our country. We talk about you know, access to income security benefits and old age security and the Canada Pension Plan and our healthcare services. All of those are the programs and the services and the things we do. So this morning, what I'd like to talk about is both, both components. So first, let's talk about the mug itself, okay, the container. And what we're trying to do our goal is to design a better container. We're designing for well-being. And you know what I find, what I love about this mix here and, and everybody here together is the fact that we have people who are involved in community design and we have people who are involved in some of the content work together. And typically in the work that we do in communities, those are two separate groups. Maybe it's different where you are. Maybe in Peterborough you have it figured out. Uh, but you know, t generally speaking, what I've seen is that you're over here doing your work on you know, the service end of things. You're over here doing the design. And what we need to do is have the conversations together because the way in which we design our space really affects how we can build caring communities. So let's talk about designing for our well-being and, and how we're going to design that better mug. I would like to talk today about four major areas and the policies here. And then we'll get into some of the conversation about the caring, what we can do in terms of the policies that enable us to care about each other. Right now, what we're going to be talking about is caring about the place where we live. So there's four major areas I'd like to talk about very briefly and the policies related to clean and green, mixed use, accessible, and engaging. Now, there may well be a longer list, and please, I don't want you to see this as sort of, this is the be all and the end all, okay? This is the beginning of a conversation, and, and so many of you are involved in this kind of work. We certainly can add to this or change it or modify it in any way, but let's just you know, work with this as the base, and then we can think about how, how we might 
figure out a perhaps a more comprehensive list. But let's go to clean and green in the first instance. Now, this may seem very obvious. Like, why are we even talking about the fact that we need to think about clean and green? Because we often take it for granted, and because in many communities, we actually don't do a good enough job in this regard. You know, several years ago, we were working at Khaled, and we worked with the Tamarack Institute and with United Way Canada on a project called Action for Neighborhood Change. And um, it was a, a project that had been supported by the federal government, and they wanted us to speak to people in the neighborhood about employment opportunities of the five neighborhoods where we had conversations with people. Not one resident spoke about employment, at least not in the first instance. What did they talk about? Garbage. They wanted to do something about the garbage in their neighborhood and make it a clean and safe place. Because in some of the neighborhoods, there was a huge pile of tires sitting at the end there, never cleaned up at potentially toxic you know, wasteland right over there. They were talking about the clean, safe parks and picking up the needles and making sure that children could play there. That was the major concern. It wasn't jumping right into the employability issues. And we have to make sure that we take care of that place. You know, in, in Ontario a number of years ago, we had a government that cut substantially um, some of the positions and it had effect, a, a serious effect on our ability to monitor the quality of the water supply. And it was actually fatal. It was deadly. I'm talking about the Walkerton tragedy, for those of you who remember it. And so we forget this at our peril. It's really essential. Now, I want to you know, just point out the fact that we're doing a lot in this country. As I was saying to you, I mean, I guess yesterday I met with, is it Peter from uh, Green Up in, in uh, Peterborough? We're doing a lot in the country. There's a lot of fantastic work underway to make sure that we are cleaning our communities and that they're green enough. What I think that we might do, what we could do, is look at some of the terrific examples of work that's underway in municipalities that have actually pushed themselves well beyond what we, you know, typically think as, well, it's, it's you know, it's okay push themselves beyond and continually press themselves to get better and to move into better areas. So for example, we have the city of Vancouver that has a green plan that aims to be the greenest city in the world. And we have Edmonton too, it's been recognized. Actually there was an, a study of, are you involved in that? Are you involved in the river, in the blue and green, ribbons of blue and green? That's fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic, 70% diversion of, uh, um, so this is Mark, Mark was just talking about what Edmonton's doing in terms of composting. And you know, it, it, there's some really excellent work underway. How do we get access to that? We have, you know, one of the challenges that we have is finding out this fantastic work that is underway in the country and being able to apply it because we start oftentimes all over again right from scratch and we don't have to. There's excellent work there. There was an index, a green city index, a study that was undertaken of 27 cities in North America. Four Canadian cities ranked in there as it was uh, Calgary as 14 and Ottawa as 12 and Toronto was nine if you can believe it but it was because of their recycling practices and Vancouver was number two. And I think that there are other cities that should have made that list for sure. But we have a lot that we can do. One of the problems that we face, I think, as citizens and as stewards is the fact that we don't often have access to the information that helps us monitor what's going on in our communities. I know at the federal level, this is becoming increasingly difficult to get access to good information. I don't know if you experience that in your own communities or if it's becoming more difficult for you perhaps as a municipal employee to share information with people in the community so that we know where we're at and we know that we're continually moving to the next level. Paul has always challenged us in all of our work to set stretch targets, to move beyond where we are now and go further. And in order to do that, we need to be able to, as citizens, know where we're at 
and monitor where we will be. Remember what Peter said yesterday about the fact that we are the stewards of this earth. And as part of our job of being caring communities is caring for our collective home. So I don't think that it's too much to say that again as citizens and to define what our role is in terms of continually, continually pushing forward and making sure that our local governments and other levels of government are actually um, monitoring and reporting and, uh, and making decisions in the public interest. One of the aspects of um, this green community, what we're learning from a lot of really interesting research coming on out now, is the role of nature. And nature in terms of, of course, our physical health and getting out there and exercising, but our mental health and our spiritual well-being. Spiritual well-being. And uh, you know, some of the literature is saying that because we are largely an urban nation now, 80% of Canadians live in cities, we've actually lost touch with nature. There's a, a, a book and, uh, called The Nature Principle, and I heard the author, Richard Liu, speak about this, saying that you know, as we've urbanized and become more and more in cities, we've actually lost our contact with the natural world. Um, and he's talking about the fact that we need to reconnect with it in some ways, and actually, and sometimes we have to retrofit our communities to bring nature back. I know it sounds ridiculous to have to do that, but in effect, that's the case. We need to, we need to think about that. There's an interesting initiative in the UK called Play England. And the national government is giving 1.1 million pounds to major local authorities and saying to them, you need to recreate your green spaces in your cities, in your municipalities, to create interesting play spaces, creative play spaces for families. And we don't mean little parks. And we don't mean little playgrounds with play structures and you know, sort of the cookie cutter things. We mean innovative, interesting green spaces for families because that's really important for our health. And Canada certainly could learn from this because a, a recent study, I don't know if any of you saw this, about active, uh, by active healthy children ranked Canada D minus you know, <laughs> in, in terms of our children and, and you know the fitness of the children, it was shocking. And they said it wasn't really because we lacked formal recreational places, it's because we lacked outdoor places for children to play and you know and, and actually get outside with their families. So you know that, that's a, a really important aspect to keep in mind. In fact there's a network of six national organizations in the UK that have joined together what they call the Wild Network. Sounds cool. <laughs> but what they're trying to do is bring nature back to our cities. Okay so let's just summarize. There's a lot more we could say about this of course. Let's just summarize. Um, we should challenge ourselves. Why can't we all become the greenest cities in the world? Green your purchasing practices. That's one of the things that we can do is encourage the purchase through our contracts, the purchase of you know, um, appropriate materials and make sure we're affecting the supply chain through those decisions. Create nature-based play spaces. One of the things when you have a lot of green in your community and nature in your community, it encourages walkability. And I wanted to talk about walkability as something really important. Because yesterday, if you recall Peter's conversation, he, he spoke about our communities as little villages, that we really should be thinking about them as little villages. We really should be thinking about how we can create spaces where we can actually walk to places. We're, we're helping to create local economies by doing that. We're purchasing things locally. We know where they're made, where they're bought, where they're sold. It's important for, our, of course, our physical health, but it's also important in terms of our networks and our relationships. And walkability is made possible by the next principle, and that is mixed use. Now, some of you may have heard about mixed use. It's being talked about increasingly. Have you heard about that? You know, it was a principle that was put forward by the great urbanist Jane Jacobs in the 1960s, and she talked about the fact that American cities were dying because 
of the design, the way in which we design those cities. And we had the bedrooms over there, and we had the work areas over there, and the shopping or the play areas over there, and we had to travel wherever we were. We had to take transportation to get to where we were. Think of what that does to the ecological footprint. Think about it, what it does to our caring relationships and our families. How much time do you spend getting to and from work every day? And what could you be doing with that time? And how exhausted are we after you know, fighting traffic and coming home? And then you know, we say, well, let's do things in our neighborhood. We, the way in which we've designed our spaces have not made it easy for us to, to develop those caring relationships because we have so much distance. And what we're looking at in community design is trying to encourage a more dense design and mixed use. And oftentimes, I hope this is changing, and maybe some of the municipal people can speak to this, um, uh, oftentimes the problem is that the zoning doesn't allow mixed use. It doesn't actually allow you to combine your, your work and your play, and you, know, you have to have your retail here, and you have to have your residential here, and we need to pull those areas together. It's really crucial. So, one of the things that Jane Jacobs talks about in terms of uh, mixed-use communities is that they're safer. They tend to be safer because she says there's more eyes on the street. And just think she writes about, you know, when you're walking down the street at night and you can hear your own footsteps clicking on the sidewalk, she said, that's scary. You know, when you're in a community where there's a lot of eyes on the street, where there's a lot going on, it tends to be a safer community. But I think we have to really think carefully about how we design because it makes us closer to the people we love. It's like Peter who wanted to stay home with his family. And that's really what we want to do. We want to effectively be closer and have more time for those relationships. Our design has created time deficits in our lives. It's totally something that we have done. And we need to figure out how to reverse that. And I, I do think there's a lot of work going on. In fact, Paul, you made reference the other day when you opened the conference, you couldn't wait to see the private sector actually understanding these concepts. So I have an article here from the business section of the Globe and Mail. Next role for the shopping mall, city state. <laughs> and this is a developer that is talking about mixed use for shopping centers. And they're saying, I mean, they have all the language. Our definition of mixed use is the creation of a community that has emotional contact with the people close to it. Now, that's not what I had in mind, <laughs> to be honest with you. When I was thinking about mixed use, it was really, you know, vibrant, small, village-type areas. But, I mean, it, it is getting into the vocabulary, and we probably don't want shopping center development to be our mixed use. So I'm pointing this out to you to say the language is out there. Let's make sure that it's used in the way that we really want it to be used. Let's not get the language hijacked, um, you know, and, and have it used in a way that's really completely opposite to what we're talking about. I personally don't want shopping center as my center of community. <laughs> Accessible. Now, you can't walk everywhere. I mean, clearly we can't walk everywhere and we're in big cities um, or you're in a rural area and you have to get from here to there. And, and one of the major problems in all cities throughout the world, in both the developed world and the developing world, is uh, accessible public transit. This is a huge challenge because it's costly, it's long term, and we need to make big investments. The important thing is that we think about what we do in the meantime, because we can't just sit and say, well, while the governments figure out all the financing arrangements, and there's a lot that we can do in the meantime to ensure that we have accessible communities. And I'm talking about accessibility from a number of perspectives. Right now, just in terms of getting from here to there, we'll move into the other aspects of accessibility in a minute. But getting from here to there, I'd love to hear some of your examples. But I know in this community, there is a co-op co around cars, you know, so that you actually you, you share your time with a car. And there's a lot of work being done. Much more has to be done around safe biking. Richard from Melbourne, you were talking well, about from, um, sorry, 
Richard, from Auckland. From Auckland, are you here? You were talking about the fact that it's not easy to bike in your community, right? It's not very safe. So we need to think about, um, at the municipal level, far more in terms of safety. We have Niagara region, a number of years ago, the problem was you couldn't get from here to there. There were jobs available, but the people who needed those jobs didn't have cars, couldn't afford it, um, and there was no public transit. So the local government got a number of people together and created a job bus and made those links so that people could link up together. So there are solutions that we can do in the meantime while we're figuring out the big political, you know, sorting that out and sorting out the technology. Communities can do a lot to ensure that we actually can um, have good means of public transit and any good examples that you have, I, I would be interested in hearing that. But let's talk about accessibility in terms of physical accessibility. Uh, because to some extent, I mean in relative terms in the country, we've come a long way. I remember working in 1981 for the Parliamentary Committee on the Disabled and the Handicapped. It was the International Year of Disabled Persons and it was the first time in the country that we ever had done an inventory of what we were doing in Canada. And it was really sad. We didn't know anything, very little, about you know, curb cuts or um, wider doors or different handles or closed captioning for the hearing impaired. Nobody even knew what that was. So from that time until now, we have you know, moved some way, but there is still a long way to go. Unfortunately, we have a lot of work to do in terms of retrofit, and that can be very expensive. And communities have to come together and figure out how to actually take our facilities and make sure that everybody can get in and that everybody has a place there. If we design for accessibility, and not just for the 14 or 15 percent of the population formally identified as disabled, but as uh, if we design for the person pushing the baby stroller and the children on the bicycles and uh, for our aging population, then we design for inclusion. And it's like getting these ideas in the water supply. It's, it's having, as Al at Mansky would say, how do you get something in the water supply so that it becomes just part of what we do? In Ontario, we have the Ontarians for um, Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act that's coming, that has come into effect, that sees a fully accessible province by the year 2025. And by the way, anybody here who works for an organization with one or more employee, you have to have a policy in place to say what you're going to do in terms of your own accessibility in your organization. At least you have to have done some training on the internet. So just in case, uh, I know some people who weren't aware of it and actually we, you know, had been informed about it. So I'm passing that along. But New Brunswick, province of New Brunswick, has introduced a new planning act. Everything new has to be accessible. City of Vancouver too, all new construction has to be accessible. The one challenge that we face is that you know, the, the physical barriers are only one part of the problem, and while they may be expensive, and while they may require expertise, and while they may need engineers to figure it out, they're doable. The biggest barriers that we face really in communities are attitudinal barriers, and oftentimes with people with vis invisible disabilities. And you know what, there's really no public policy that can legislate changes to attitudes. But what public policy can do is encourage inclusion and support the groups and the work that's the fantastic work that's underway, for example, in PLAN, and I'll be talking more about that in the next, in the second part of this, support the work of inclusion. And that's how we change attitudes. That's how we bring down the attitudinal barriers that are probably far more difficult and far more challenging than some of the physical barriers. So let's just review our major, oops. We're designing for inclusion. We're designing for the person with the stroller. Actually, the World Health Organization has a major initiative called Age Friendly Cities. Some of you may be involved. But just thinking about designing for inclusion and then requiring accessible construction, not just 
saying it would be nice, requiring it, and then providing some financing for retrofit. These are the, some of the things that governments can do. But it's one thing to get from here to there with accessible transportation or walkability. It's another thing to be in a place where you actually can be there physically. Perhaps the most important thing about our space is having a voice. David, you asked this question yesterday to Peter. You asked an excellent question to Peter about how can we ensure that people are involved, that they have a say in the, in the policies and in the programs that affect them. And I think the last and the most uh, important part of our design, or what I'll be talking about in terms of design, is engaging, communities that engage. Oftentimes, what governments do is uh, set up consultation processes. They have two or three, let's say, choices, and they bring you together, and you kind of vote on, the, vote on that choice. And that's not really what engagement's all about, as you know. So, you know, engagement really is working with people right from the beginning, designing together some of those solutions. Ideally, even bringing people together to ask them the questions, not just working on the solutions. But, you know, we don't make that very easy. And I think, we, you know, oftentimes those processes are very intimidating. I don't know about you, but when I go into some of those uh, hearings, it's scary. You know, when you're sitting, in fact, in some of our hearings we're called witness. I thought, I'm not in a court, you know, here's the witness, with a witness, the witness, please speak, you know, and, and it's like you're being, well, exactly, well, I think, I, I think I was, I think I was after the presentation, I was certainly the accused, but, you know, it, it's just the way in which we do these things, and first of all, you know, you, you have sort of your formal, and you're all mic'd up, and then you have your five minutes, and by the time you say your name, and your organization, you introduce your team, your time is up, you can say your one line, and, you know, there's just a feeling about it that it's not real, it's not authentic, and so how can we reach out to people in communities and go where they are and how can we support their participation either through you know providing childcare or maybe some kind of transportation or maybe a meal how can we um, use interesting and innovative kinds of approaches to reach people who typically would not feel comfortable in, in engaging so i know for example i love this example from red deer which is fantastic from Delbert, and, and there was um, an interesting project in Southeast Ottawa called the, Vo um, the Photo Voice Project. And it was for young, it involved young people who were from families who were new Canadians, and many of them didn't have facility with, with English or French, and they were learning the language, but they wanted to find out what the young people were thinking. So they gave each of them a camera, and they said, take pictures of what you like in your neighborhood and take pictures of what's not working for you. What do you not like? And they put it together in a photo mon montage like you did there. And what was really amazing, was what they didn't like were the fact that there were these massive holes in the basketball courts and there was this rusted playground equipment and they showed physically what was wrong. And the city officials at the event were so embarrassed that they literally had people in there the following day fixing the playground and the whole basketball courts. And I'm telling you, any number of briefs, you know, and reports and would not have had the impact that those young people did through their photos. And I wanted to say, you know, I know that engagement is crucially important. And I'm conscious, though, of the role of some of you as local government officials where you know, you can't, you, you do have to go ahead and make some decisions sometimes. You can carry this to the nth degree and then we have stalemate and we can't get anything done. And then, and then citizens disengage because they say, well, nothing ever happens. So I think what we need to do is think strategically about, you know, what are the issues around which we want to in, in, need to engage. You don't have to have a community consultation necessarily around, you know, how many chickens are allowed in the backyard or how we're going to divide this. But, you know, around our caring communities and building our relationships, which are so fundamentally important, we need to think that way. Okay, so uh, those are just some examples we can go on. I'd love to hear more from you. Oops. Here we go. 
creative ways of providing feedback, of engaging, reaching out to citizens, and co-constructing policy. Just let me put that one thought, last thought, before I move to the next section. Co-construction is becoming sort of something that's being, maybe, gee, you might be able to talk to this. You probably know more about it than I do. But in, in some parts of Europe, there's experimentation going on with uh, government sitting down with citizens and around really crucial pieces of their policy puzzle and saying we need to work with you to actually figure out how we're going to do this. And Mike Toy is here from Sednet. Sednet published an interesting paper with Le Chantier called The Co-Construction of Policy on the Social Economy in Quebec. And you know, it, it's, it's, they document how the government w worked with the community to construct the policy around the social economy. So it's just something to think about, something on the horizon, and we're certainly looking to, to move in that direction. Not easy for politicians, we have a, a range of challenges, but. So let's just summarize. Local governments, what can they do? Among other things, okay? Become the greenest city in the world, introduce zoning for mixed use, require accessible design and fund retrofit, engage and not just consult. Now that's just a baseline. Again, we can fix it, move it, but that basically it relates to our space, our physical space and how we design it. Let's talk a little bit about our caring relationships and what we do, because I think that's really you know, one of the major things, obviously, that we're all concerned about. Okay, so that's our next challenge. How do, we, how do we create a good brew? How do we work on what's in there? Before I start talking about this, let me just say that when I wrote Reclaiming Our Humanity, to which Paul referred this morning, the first thing that I talked about was poverty and poverty reduction and the role of governments, this crucial role of government in terms of its redistributive role, its role in creating equality of opportunity, its role in reducing income inequality, and we're seeing that now become a huge problem in the country. I'm not going to be going into in detail, unless you have any questions, I certainly will address them, but I'm not talking today about the redistributive policies and programs about which we've written extensively. But it's crucial, I want to acknowledge it and to say that any of you who would either like to talk about it or would want to read more, we have written about that and it is always, always there either implicitly or explicitly as the basis for all our work. Because you really can't, at the end of the day, have a caring community with some people who don't have enough to eat. I mean, it just, it does, you know, that's what it is. So um, let's talk about some of the things that we can do locally and create that great brew. And what I want to talk about today are four major areas. Again, there's more, okay? There's more, but four major areas. Personal communities, circles of support, long dinner tables, and celebration. Okay, personal communities. You know, we talked about the community itself and the place where we live, but really I think what we also need to do and think about is how we build personal communities around people. Everybody should have a personal community. Again, it sounds obvious, but sometimes we don't. And I know, for example, when, when I first moved to the Ottawa, where I'm living right now, we didn't know anybody. I had no family and friends there. And thank goodness for the local library because the local library opened its doors on Monday, Wednesday, Friday morning, and it had a play room for parents with young children, and you could go there, and there was no fee, and you didn't have to register, and you didn't have to line up overnight and then be turned away because there were no more places. Um, it was for everybody, and there was, it was very simple sandbox and some toys and some books and a few chairs and apple juice and a cookie for 25 cents a person. And that was it. That was our sophisticated program. Thank goodness for that program because it was, of course, wonderful for the kids. It was really wonderful for the parents, many of whom were alone, many of whom you know, didn't have the supports. We made friends, we met new people, we shared our concerns. And one day, I remember getting a call from one of the mothers on, in the group. 
And you know, usually when you call somebody, you usually typically say, hello, <laughs> how are you doing? You know, on this call, I answered the phone and she said, do you want to, do you want to prevent a meltdown? Actually, she said, do you want to prevent a murder? But I, I didn't want to say that, but it's true. And I just said, bring her over, that was all. And in, you know, in five minutes, she was on the doorstep with this screaming child. <laughs> and I really wonder what would have happened that day. You know, um, Maybe the children's aid would have been involved in some way. But we had each other. And that was so great. And what do we have in communities? We have uh, family service centers and, and where you wait three weeks to get to be seen and you're assessed and you have to pay. That's not what we needed or what she needed. She was a great parent. You know, what she needed is a little break and some relief. That's what most of us need. We want to do what we're doing you know, with our kids and our parents. And sometimes we just need a break. And we don't really have that in our communities. We don't really have the facility to, to give people a break and to create those personal networks where you can just call and, and have somebody you trust and you can go to, you know? So we wait until the crises occur. How do cre we create personal communities around people? Plan, you've been brilliant in that regard because that's effectively what you do. And um, again, it's around creating those communities around families so that you're never alone and that you have somebody to whom you can turn. One of the mothers in that little play group, the Monday, Wednesday, Friday group, <laughs> it was great too because you know you got there when you got there, nobody cared about the time, and it was really wonderful, flexible, and cheap for the city. Um, one of the mothers created a babysitting co-op, which was very helpful because we knew who the babysitters would be and we knew who the kids would be. They were little playmates. It was great service. And of course that forms the basis for the kind of thing that John McKnight has written about so brilliantly over the years, the exchange networks. Because once you begin to form those networks, you can move into other areas of sharing of skills, other areas of sharing your assets and your gifts, as, as John says. I remember hearing a woman speak at a community meeting, and she got up and said, you know what, I'm not wealthy, I'm poor. In fact, I'm cash poor. But she said, but I'm community rich. And I'm community rich because I have a network where I can call someone, they'll do my plumbing and my carpentry and painting and shoveling, the things that I'm not really able to do. But I can cook and I can babysit and I can type and I can drive and I have a lot I can offer. And that notion of, you know, I am a person who has skills and, and something that other people want. Um, she said, I, I feel I'm rich. I feel, you know, that I can live a good life. Uh, and, and it was really powerful to hear her say that. And, and that's not the message we typically give to people who are low income or living in poverty. That's certainly not the message that they hear from service providers and from society more generally. So this was a very simple notion. We can make space available, public space available to enable people to form those kinds of community networks that were so valuable. We can provide the support for the kinds of um, initiatives in which PLAN is involved, rather than putting a lot of our money into formal services where we wait until the crises occur. There was a fellow in our group from Hamilton who was talking yesterday about reclaiming the buildings. Are you here today? Is it? Oh, can you just talk? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, what is your name again? Is it Bill? Bill was talking in, in our group about the fact that one of the things he does is take some of the buildings that are no longer being used in Hamilton and turning them into wonderful community spaces that, again, attracts artists, attract all kinds of people, who, you know, and then you can enable the creation of those personal communities. In Ontario, there's the community use of schools where the government will pay the school boards a certain amount of money so that they don't have to pay extra for their insurance. It's all a bureaucratic thing, but 
right. Anyway, the, the province picks up the cost of the insurance so that the school can stay open on the evening and the weekend, and we make use of our space in that way. So it's not necessarily a complex thing. It's just that we have to recognize how important that is. What can communities do? What can policy do? Informal, flexible supports. Support time and skills exchange through local assets as a rich inventory of supports. But let's think more creatively about the use of our space because there's a lot that we can do in that space. Let's move in a little bit to looking at more closer networks, circles of support. And I just, I like this notion of the rings here. <laughs> um, I guess I started thinking about circles of support. John McKnight and I were talking about this last night and didn't realize that we knew a same, similar per, same person who first, in my view, was the first one I heard talking about this. And she's a disability activist by the name of Judith Snow. You know, she talked about the fact that all of us in our own lives have circles around us. We have four circles. There's a circle of intimacy, our family, our friends. There's a next network, which is a circle of friendship, which is sort of more, you know, people with whom you socialize. The third ring is a circle of participation, and those are the people you meet through participating in groups and clubs and, you know, religious institutes. And then there's a circle of exchange, and those are the people who are in your lives because they're paid to be there. And so what she says is that for most people, most, you know, Canadians, you have these rings. Your circle of friendship and your circle of participation are very rich and alive, and, and it's full. And for people with disabilities, typically, especially children, they are, you know, their circles are in number one and four, their family and the people who are paid to be there. And the challenge is to create the kinds of space where everybody belongs and to make sure that you're, providing opportunities for people to belong and make friends. And I know that, Joe, you're involved in the Possibility Initiative, and Al, you created the Belonging Initiative and have really, really taken this notion of um, helping, helping create communities that welcome people, that make them feel comfortable. Another example of circles of support, I don't know if any of you have heard about what's going on in Australia. The Australia Centre for Social Innovation created a program called Family to Family. And it was really, family by family? Yeah. And it was really, um, it, it's very interesting because what it's saying is that there are families who are challenged in some way. But we're, instead of giving them formal counseling or, you know, sort of uh, in a formal organization, what we're going to do is pair them with another family. And we're not going to identify the at-risk youth or the alcoholic father or whatever, you know, the problem person in the family and work with that problem person. What we're going to do is say, we need to support the whole family, and we're going to pair them with another family, and the role of the professional is to be a coach behind the scenes and to say, I'll help you if there's any challenges that you face, but effectively, you're providing support to each other. Another group in the UK called Participle is working on this basis of creating circles around people, and they've done a lot with seniors, for example. And that's being called the co-production of services. If you hear that term or have done any reading in that area, that's where we're moving. It's not easy in terms of some of the established organizations that don't want their services to change. <laughs> that's a whole other conversation. So, sustained care and assistance, belonging through human connection, co-production of services. So, we have two more areas that I wanted to talk about very briefly in, in our caring communities. The long dinner table. This thought was inspired by Paul's book. For those of you who have read or will read Paul's uh, most recent book, he talks very often about getting together with members of his family and members of the Mennonite community around long dinner tables and how powerful it was to his family and himself personally. And it wasn't just the food, which he loves, and he describes beautifully <laughs> in the book, but it was more the comfort food. It was more the security of being with people and knowing that you were part of, an, of some kind of 
a secure base and you had a network of relationships. And I was thinking, we have to do something with that long dinner table approach more creatively. We really need to think about how can we do this as part of our community celebrations or on an ongoing basis welcome our kids to do performances in the community and combine it with some kind of long dinner table. Um, so that we're not just looking at food banks. I mean, food banks, they do, uh, they're important in the sense that they provide emergency assistance, but they never were intended to be the front line of food security that they've become. So, how can we think more creatively about food? There was Mona in our group from Smith Falls. Are you here, Mona? <laughs> there you are. You talked about making pasta with a group of young people and how incredible that was as an experience because it helped build those relationships. And they also had a great dinner, right? And then somebody else, would, I think it was Ali, who talked yesterday from Owen Sound, who talked about the fact that sometimes it's not easy to do this because we have public health agencies that prohibit us from doing certain kinds of things. Sometimes public policy gets in the way and we have to figure out, we have to work with public health departments and figure out how can we get them out of the way because you know what, this is really good for our health. <laughs> That's how you can promote our health, figure out how we can support this kind of activity. Let's work more creatively on the long dinner tables because I think there's a lot that we can do around food security. So relationships and engagement create alternatives to food banks, relationships and food security. I just want to talk very briefly about community celebration. I don't know how many of you experienced in this park, actually, the multicultural celebration here the other day. Wasn't it fun? It was wonderful, everybody coming. I know probably all of you could speak about a wonderful celebration in your community. My personal favorite back home happens to be the Tulip Festival. And number one, it marks the end of a really, 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 really long winter. <laughs> And number two, it's beautifully colorful and everything's coming alive. It's like a personal rejuvenation for everybody. And third, it's actually important historically because it, uh, the, the government, the Dutch government actually sends tulip bulbs to Ottawa every year because of the role that Ottawa played in helping to protect the Dutch monarchy. So it's, you know, it's a very interesting cultural um, or, uh, sort of event with many components. They used to have a multicultural component as well in a big park, and we loved that too. It was so much fun. And one year, we arrived at the park with our family, and the whole thing was fenced in with a huge, massive fence, and you had to go in through one gate. You used to be able to, like here, you could come in from anywhere. No, you had to go in through the gate, pass through the security, and pay your, your fee for your family. And I still remember that moment, coming to that gate and thinking, how ridiculous is this? How stupid is this? Community celebrations are for everybody to feel part of something, to contribute in some way. They are not fundraisers for the city. And we have to really think about that in terms of making inclusive celebrations because they are part of what forms our glue, our social glue. Now I know that they did charge money because there's a big problem and I'll talk about that in just one minute. Let's separate, let's uh, just summarize this and we'll get into that one little problem. So community celebration, it's a glue. In, t in some cases, a lot of communities are using um, poetry and other kinds of uh, art in terms of being an economic contributor and it's fun. Policy forgot the fun. I don't know if any of you have followed some of the developments in the recent, at least federal policy, but everything is cast within the framework of its economic action plan. Either your employability or creating a job, but everything else is sort of over here or has to somehow figure out how to use that language. Fun is pretty important in our lives and it's important not to forget that it really contributes enormously to our well-being. But let's just, before we conclude, just want to touch on one little policy issue. Oh, sorry, can we summarize here? So what can local governments do? Make greater use of public space. Em embrace co-production, enable the long table initiatives, and eliminate user fees 
for community celebration. We don't want to see it. Let's talk briefly about this. This is a mug, <laughs> and that's a handle, the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room, with respect to doing any of this, both the context and the content, is the fact that our communities and our cities are not appropriately funded in Canada. And Alan Broadbent writes about this eloquently in his book, Urban Nation. Some of you may have read that or heard him speak. And the problem is that local governments and municipalities, communities, whatever their size, have huge and wide-ranging responsibilities. We, we saw all the things that you know, local governments could do and should do, and, and of course they have to fix their aging infrastructure, and they're dealing with increasingly complex problems. Someone from Red Deer yesterday raised the issue of complexity in the session with Peter and said, you know, how do we deal with the fact that we're, we're actually addressing such complex problems now? So the problem is that they don't have the fiscal capacity to be able to do a lot of this because municipalities are creations of provinces. They don't have their own forms of revenue. The only forms of revenue they have are property taxes, which are regressive, and licenses and fees and parking tickets. I used to say to my kids when they got a parking ticket, great, you're contributing to the <laughs> recreation program. That's good. I mean, there are some good things happening, though, in the country, and we have to keep arguing that for that shift. Here's the wide-ranging responsibilities, limited fiscal capacity. There are some good things that are happening. So we do have a federal, um, in the last federal budget and the one before, there was something called Building Canada. So there was a lot of money put aside for infrastructure for municipalities. It's 53 billion over 10 years, which is not a lot given the fact that our infrastructure deficit in the country is at least 500 billion and only for certain major types of infrastructure. But it's a good start, and there was a gas tax that was uh, allowed to municipalities as well. I know that, there, that there's probably a lot of problems with it, and you all could likely speak to that. But until we get all that constitutional issue sorted out, some of these are good things. There are some provinces that are allowing municipalities to have other forms of revenue raising, like Alberta, for example. They, they are looking at, you know, how can we actually enable our municipalities to have other sources of financing so that we can do the kinds of things that we're doing. There are some governments making important grants to municipalities, like I talked about the Ontario community use of schools or some of the investment in recreational infrastructure. We also have a lot of money that we're spending in tax breaks for individual families that are relatively well off. And we've done a lot of writing about this at Caledon, where we should be, in our view, using that money for investing in communities for everybody. So for example, our recreational fitness credit that goes toward higher income families was worth an estimated 115 million last year. That's just that one credit alone. So multiply that by all the boutique tax credits that have been introduced over the past six years or so, and you're talking a few billion dollars. So where there's money there that can be reconverted and invested into communities for everybody. And finally, there are some municipalities doing some interesting things in recognition of the need to, um, you know, to overcome some of those barriers and make sure that their services are affordable. So Calgary, for example, had a fair fares program to uh, help people with their local bus fares, and they expanded that to Fair Calgary to look at affordability across the board. Hamilton, you have some interesting recreational subsidies. When you go home, please check your recreational policy and your subsidy for recreation. Do you have one? And if you do, do you require somebody to go to a doctor <laughs> to get a medical form signed and pay $50 so you can get a $40 subsidy? You have, uh, there are some municipalities that have that. So let's make sure that we have intelligent, intelligent policies for affordability. Vancouver, for example, just introduced a, a, a leisure card called One Card, like a credit card. And it's provided to every family that qualifies for the National Child Benefits Supplement, which means a net family income of $25,000 approximately, or less, depending on your family size. And you get this card. 
and it gives you access to city programs at reduced cost or free access to some of the you know, municipal places. And it's like a credit card. It's not like a special subsidy form where you come in with a big sign on your forehead saying, you know, subsidy. Um, it's one of the ways that we can do, and also your attendant, actually, if you need an attendant for any reason, you can have a, an access card for your attendant. So there's some good work. Uh, there is a big elephant in the room, but there is some good work underway, and until we get the big, big, big financing issue sorted out, we can at least make the case to move along in the right direction. So let's summarize here in terms of communities. What can communities do? What can you do? You hold the values. We, I think, together hold the values that we can articulate very clearly. Somebody needs to be the steward of our values and say what's important. And sometimes it's not easy to do that because you may not have an audience for that. But somebody has to keep doing that and making sure that's said and keep pushing in that direction. John said yesterday, even the little pieces, even the pieces that may not seem like they're going somewhere, together they will. We will, we will get there, but we have to keep the message, we have to keep the story going in the right direction. And somebody has to keep that story alive, and we have to do that. There's a lot of other things that we can do in community. We can engage and we can test out uh, models, and we can do a lot, but I, I think our primary role is to really be the keepers of that very, very important story. And I think together, if we design for our well-being, and if we care for and about each other, if we have policies that move in, the, in that direction, to me, that's our way of giving expression to our humanity. That's what it's all about at the end of the day. Thank you so much. Could you tell me if that pop-up City Hall was an actual event or just a stock photo? And if it was, could you tell me about it, please? Hey, that's, a, that's a picture of the <coughs> sorry, City of Vancouver. City of Boston was the first to have a pop-up City Hall. And it took City Hall out to the community. Rather than saying to people, you have to come to us all the time, they took City Hall out to the community. And Vancouver is the first city in the country to have <coughs> excuse me, pop-up City Hall. So, you, you know, you can um, get your, your, your green box or your blue box, whatever it might be. You can register for programs. You can find out about what's going on in the city. You can apply for permits. But it's taking City Hall to you. So thank you for asking, because it wasn't just a canned photo. It actually was real. And I think that's Gregor Robertson. Is it, not, is it not your mayor of Vancouver there? Yeah, yeah. So it is a real thing. Hi, Sherry. My name is Linda. I'm, maybe I shouldn't admit what city I'm, gonna, I'm from when I ask the question I'm going to ask, but um, we work in municipal government and love these ideas and the policy and recognize the impact that we can have. But sometimes city government isn't very nimble. And when you threw the word foundation up on the screen, it kind of got me thinking, is there another way to organize to influence municipal government? Because like you mentioned, it's so diverse. And it has such a broad focus. And I just look at organizational structure and I think, well, it, it, you know, could you, and maybe this is a question that's a little bit deeper, but um, could you organize a nonprofit that's a foundation base that mobilizes community and works to do some of the things that government sometimes, because of its own complexity, has a hard time um, yeah. getting under? That's yeah. the question. And, and I think, you know, this is a, I think, a set of foundations that we can do and that all of us can do. This isn't just about telling somebody else what to do. I, I think these are really values and principles that should guide all our activity. I know that we can do much of this through our own policy and ourselves, through the community programs that we organize, and by doing it, we're setting examples. So, you know, it's not all about just sitting back and saying, here's what you as government need to do. It's saying, we have a vision, we're 
giving life to this vision. We're translating this vision into action. And this is what we hope you can do too in your policy. So I, I really appreciate your question and, and the opportunity to clarify that because I don't want it to look like that, then, you know, all we have to do is go to City Hall and say, look, this is what you have to do. We're, and then we go home, you know, this is your agenda. Um, it's not, it's really, I think, the way in which we can shape our thinking together. And if we have values and concepts that, as I said, I love this expression from Al Atmansky when he says, if you can get it into the water street and water supply, then you know, you've influenced everybody's way of thinking. So if we can begin to plan and think in this way, then I believe that we'll have an influence eventually upon local government and governments at other levels. We certainly shouldn't stop and just wait for that to happen, that's for sure. But I'd be interested if anybody who's here from local government or from, or from anywhere would like to respond to that as well, please, please do so. Please, yeah, because you, you know probably better than I do. One of the things that's really challenging, I think, for them is that um, by turning over some of that policy direction to the community, their political fate rests in the hands of the electorate, which should make sense. I mean, it does make sense, but um, there, I think there's a, a caution or a fear about you know, what is the outcome of that community engagement going to be? And if a decision rolls out that I don't personally support, um, where does that put me uh, in the polls next time out? And so there's this reluctance or this discomfort um, turning it over and, and letting go of that um, control. And so that's challenging. That's why co-designing policy with community, I think, is challenging for um, the elected officials. Thank you for speaking, you know, identifying that, Scott. And I think it's, it's very real because you know, it's easy from the outside, perhaps, to say you should do this and you should do that. But when you're an elected official and maybe you've campaigned on a certain platform and you've promised certain things and then you engage with a community group and that platform shifts or changes or drops entirely, then you have to be accountable for that. And so it's not easy for public officials to necessarily work in this way. And I think what you've said to us is to really, to recognize that and be sensitive that we're asking something new. And um, we would like to be able to work in a new way. And how can we figure it out together? You know, I, I really, I'm, I really appreciate your comment. Uh, you know what, I, what? One of the things that we didn't really have enough time to talk about today is um, art in the street and music in the street and engaging children and communities and painting together. And there's a lot that, you know, that we could follow up on and I would really love it if at some point we you know could do that or have a conversation about it and because there's a lot to be said for fun <laughs> and it's really important it's serious business <laughs> and and we don't see it that way you know and, and typically in policy terms as I said you're laughed out of court if you raise that you know uh, issue so I'm glad we can talk about it comfortably and thank you for raising it Okay, so we'll take one more comment and then we'll move into break, but I'll, I'll give you some direction about that. But here's our final comment. I asked this question yesterday of Peter Block, or a version of it, and I'm, and, but not realizing that, of course, he wouldn't know the Canadian context. He probably couldn't really answer it, but I'm hoping that you can, uh, or that you might have insight on our recent Ontario election and where we had two candidates, one who said very clearly that you know, decreased taxes and austerity measures is the way to go. The other that said she's going to increase taxes and you know, not austerity measures. Well, sort of. Uh, and 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 so for the first time in a long time, I felt like I was hearing politicians actually speak openly about what their beliefs are. I mean, I think we're all cynical about the extent to which they actually do that. But and the person that was was believed in increasing taxes and 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 not austerity measures won. Yes, we do pay taxes, but guess what? We actually get things back for those taxes. It's not a money grab. There are things that we're doing together that we're investing in 
together and we're getting something back for that and it, it's, it's our health and our well-being. And so I, I, do, I do think that message is getting through, actually. Mm -hmm. We'll see. I mean, it may be, you know, <laughs> it may be just what happened in Ontario. I don't know. But I, I think that message about the important role of public policy is, uh, is shifting somewhat, I hope.